So let's get started, everybody. Hey, thanks for coming out tonight on this rainy, uh, rainy Thursday night here in New York. We probably lost a few people because of the weather. But today we're going to talk about the topic here is how automation can impact your compensation. So my name is Thomas Young. I'm uh, managing partner at Rumjog Enterprise, a small consulting firm. We specialize really in this space. We've been doing this for about five years. And we're starting to see major impacts in the market with, with respect to shortages of people who know how to do this. And the market is getting very frothy in terms of compensation, people being bid out of jobs for 50, 80%. And if they pivot into other realms, they can go much higher than that. 1X, 2X, and 3X their baseline compensation. If that sounds crazy. It's not dissimilar to what you may have seen in cybersecurity and stuff like that, but this is a little bit more acute because the business impacts are much more tangible. So with that, I'm going to flip through. People that say, hey, what's Rumjog? There's a couple things. It's, it's, Tony Rumjog was an alter ego of mine, which is essentially my name rearranged. And because I was a public official and, and, and blogging in the past, I didn't want it to be used in a campaign. I blogged under a pseudonym, which was Tony Rumjog. And when I started the company five years ago, when I left the major consulting firm, I used this as a name and it stuck. It's very funny. People think there's rum and jogging involved. There's none of that. I like rum, but I don't like jogging. So, now this, I got at Glamour Shots. Anybody that's been to Glamour Shots, I did that. That was pretty cool. I did a big photo shoot. This is the, la the photo we chose. Uh, the focus of, I used to work for, uh, work for many firms. I did a lot of stint in M&A, worked at AT&T. And then I worked in consulting for about 15 years, doing a lot of uh, services deals in the IT and BPO space, business process outsourcing. But I started to see five, six, seven years ago, the impact of technology on services contracts that were, it was unexplainable. We weren't seeing derivative pricing based on offshoring of taking high cost labor, low cost labor. And we coined this term called digital labor. So we actually have a small, we have a trademark in the US. I don't know the details of it, TJ knows the details of the trademark, but we have some version of a trademark for the term digital labor, which is the notion of software replacing people. So did a lot of work with most of these companies here, many more, let's flip to the next one. So this gets to the notion of what is digital labor? A lot of times people will hear, you'll hear the term robotics process uh, automation. RPA. I don't like that term because you'll see pictures of a person shaking hands with a robot, you'll see phys physical manifestations of a robot. It's got nothing to do with that. There's no physicality to this trend. This is software, scripts, think of more, it's more like Excel macros on steroids than it is a physical robot. Now, physical robots are making wild leaps and bounds, but don't confuse the two. One is the software control systems that understand what's happening. The other is the physical stuff. So a company called Boston Dynamics, they work with DARPA. They'll, they show things, you'll see videos, you've probably seen them where they have the pack mules running stuff and you can't even tip them over. You push them and they're using them in warehouses to move boxes and stuff like that. And, and military is using them for exoskeletons and things like that. So there's a physical dimension to robots. One of the biggest users of robots physically is Amazon in their warehouse with the Kiva robots. If you've ever gotten a chance to see that, go on YouTube and go look at one of those videos. But that's not what this is. Digital labor is software. And software that does things at the low end through process automation, then autonomics, and then cognitive. Process automation is, is basically performing a task for you. Autonomics is looking at the world around you and deciding which task should I perform for you in an automated way and cognitive is really understanding decision making and how the human brain works and performing some of those functions that are uh, uh, based on the criteria of decision rules. So let's go to the next slide. I'm giving you this foundation because I want to tell you why, how this is in fact impacting the ability to become an expert in this market, which is up, really up to you. And I'm going to show you why it's up to you. So there's two types of automation. Automation of the routine, that's the RPA that you hear about, robotics process automation. And then there's automation of judgment. And that's what you should, when you hear the word cognitive, you should think of cognitive being on that side. Very different technologies, extremely different, but they get confused in the marketplace, but they're different. So let's go to the next slide. When I first started, I worked 
with IPSoft, who's probably one of the leading providers of automation software. Uh, it's the place is filled with really smart people. You walk around, it's like a, an adventure every day. And we developed this model when I was there to describe the differences in automation that you see in the marketplace. Because we would go out and do briefings, especially on Wall Street, where they're very advanced in their deployment of technology. So we're doing automation. Well, of course we are. We've been doing automation for years. Right? So we developed this automation maturity model that's a five-level model that describes the different technologies involved with automation. So you can get a sense. Now, these are not evolutionary technologies. They stack on top of each other. So as you move from level one to level two to level three, there are different technologies that stack on and leverage the technologies underneath it. So the first one is scripting. And think of that in a car as cruise control. Just performs a task for you and does it for you well, right? Orchestration is level two. It's script of scripts. It takes two things, puts them together in a car that's adaptive cruise. If I use another metaphor, in music, it would be a piano playing a song versus a band or orchestra playing a set piece of music. When I move to level three, I move to autonomics. Now up here, you see on the table, I'm adding an A to the mix. I'm automating, I'm adapting the automation, and then I'm adapting the automation based on awareness. That's what autonomics is. That's the Google car. So in transportation, it's the Google car takes a million data points a second and, make, and decides how to make a left-hand turn in traffic. Music, that might be a jazz riff. Precognitive, is using the digital exhaust that comes out of this to do predictive analytics. And figure out what the future is going to hold so I can do predictive routing or understand this way contextual music. And then the last one is cognitive, which is decision making based on the human brain and how that works and interacting with people in the way that humans think. And I would say probably uh, this is where IPsoft is putting a lot of their, their investment in their platform called Amelia. And uh, recently, you'll see Google Duplex doing a lot of work on their cognitive agent, uh, Google Assistant. So let's go to the next one. This is another picture. Gartner did something similar. We were one of the first ones out with a framework for this. And other people tried to copy different things. I'll just show you a few. They're very similar. This one's a three-dimensional radar graph. It shows you know, out from mimics all the way up to create unexpected value to process versus tax base, and then an ecosystem versus you know, small. So these are just interesting to look at, because we look at these to see, are people validating or invalidating what we say? Most of the content that I'm sharing with you here is vetted. And by vetted, I mean I share this within the industry, and I get comments before I show it in a place like this. So let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of Forrester's wave map of who are all the RPA providers. Now, this is the this is what's really hot today. The cognitive stuff is going to be hot, but you, the creds in the, the background you need to be to move the needle on cognitive is, is pretty high, and we'll, I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. These are some of the players. You have Automation Anywhere, UiPath, Blue Prism, Pega in the BPO space, WorkFusion, et cetera. These are all the players, and what we did is we took this, go to the next slide, and we mapped it to our orchestration model, or our automation model, rather, so you can see where these players go. And they're, they're spanning multiple technologies here. And I only share this with you to say, this looks a lot like, if you're old enough to remember, the late and middle 90s, where you had all of these internet.com companies out there, lots of internet ISPs, lots of browsers, lots of different things, doing this, that, and the other thing. And a lot of them went bust. And a lot of these will go bust. So some of these will be left standing and probably some new players will emerge. So let's go to the next slide. If you were at our last meetup, we talked about the decomposition of work. Like, what's different about this work, that work, and the other thing. So we have this do, how, what, why. The do and the how is highly prone to this automation that we're talking about. It's people performing work. So think of the concept of human middleware. And so you probably had jobs or had an aspect of a job or you know people were in jobs, that's all they do is human middleware. They're doing something that's a set routine, they're following a set of business rules and they're executing those rules. They may be interfacing with five, six, seven systems and they're performing this function. Above this you have the what and the why, which are more questions about what should we be doing and why should we be doing it. <coughs> Typically this is executive realm. 
But as I do this, I'm left with the concept of residual labor, which we think is going to start to port to a very high concentration of expert labor. And this is what we're going to talk about, how it affects your compensation. So let's go to the next slide. <coughs> so if we look at the hypothetical compensation curve, there was, about, there was a video on YouTube, got a, a shit ton of uh, views. It was called Wealth Concentration in, the Ameri in America. And it talked about how wealth was concentrated to the 1%. That's true, it is. And this is the curve that it looks like. This is the poor people, middle class. The reason this looks similar is because this is so damn high. Uh, you see the very top of the people making printing, making bank, right? Let's go to the next slide. <coughs> when we decompose this labor curve that people are generally familiar with, you see people who earn their living with muscle, right? This is the old school jobs, right? And then the people who earn their living today, their brains. So let's look at, let's break it down one more level. In the muscle realm, we have the grunts or the unskilled labor, and you have the tradespeople. So this could be a welder or a plumber or uh, an electrician, whereas this is the proverbial ditch digger or assembly line worker, or today, a truck driver. The number one job in this country is truck driver in terms of numbers. And very soon, they're going to have their jobs automated. Very soon, what? One, two, three, five years? Depends. Who knows? I'm not going to predict it, but it's going to happen. On the right, you have a similar realm here. Knowledge workers who are information processors, largely, they're gathering information and processing it so senior manager can make decisions. They're human middleware. And then here you have your execs, executive class. And you see here, the, the trades have a 3x, 5x compensation ratio to the grunts. The execs have a 3 to 5x relative to the knowledge workers, but they're 100x the grunts. So let's go to the next slide. So what we saw in the transformation of the agrarian and industrial society was analog automation. And this is why it's important to get your terms right. Analog automation is mechanization. So assembly lines replacing workers uh, doing work along assembly lines, now robots are doing it. So if you look at a car being made, it's made largely with robots, spot welding, painting, etc. But this pushed down the wages of the unskilled over the last 75 years. What's happening next is we're going to start to see digital automation happen and it's going to push the wages down of knowledge workers because they're just information processors and human middleware. This took place over three generations. This will take place in a half a generation. right? And this is going to push this down. Now, what emerges from this is what we're talking about here tonight. Let's go to the next one, which is this emerging expert class. It's the people who sit to the right-hand side of this curve, below the executive class, who are the experts at figuring out how all this stuff works, right? Because there's, there's more demand than there are people to go do it. So I have two guys on my team here tonight. Bart, who's driving the laptop, he's performing a grunt work right now. <laughs> but he is actually an emerging expert class participant in TJ over there. So both these guys, are, by all definitions, what I would call an emerging expert class. Neither one of them majored in STEM, uh, and three years ago, they weren't doing any of this, right? And so, TJ, you've been out of school five years? Five years, yeah. And so tell me about a little bit what happened after you got out of school. So, did consulting for a little bit. I uh, worked on uh, financial modeling and financial analysis for another outsourcing company, or another um, consulting company focusing on outsourcing. Joined this group back in 2013, or no, 2015. Um, very quickly, I was placed on, you're going to see a video from this client on the Beckham Dickinson account, one of our main clients recently. Um, a lot of the research we do and a lot of the IP we put out is around automation. It's around digital labor, looking at cognitive. You see all these buzzwords today on machine learning and how it's changing industries. Um, we focus a lot on that. And it, at first, it was just for fun. It was just to kind of learn about it, talk about it, have a few beers at the bar, and discuss theory. Um, I had been staffed on the BD account uh, right after the team had kind of performed an outsourcing project. They moved a lot of jobs offshore and they freed up a lot of cash. 
we had convinced them to spend some of that cash and reinvest it into some of this new cool tech, right? RPA, cognitive, a lot of the stuff we're talking about here, data analytics. The interesting thing about RPA, robotic process automation, and we hate that term, but is it's not really a new technology. It's very simple, it's been around for decades, but the way it's been packaged is different. These companies like Automation Anywhere, UiPath, those are probably the top two firms in RPA today, we saw on the previous slide. What they're doing is they're just making, they're taking the capability of making a platform, kind of a UI, the tool itself, accessible to really anybody. So the RPA developers that we work with are not programmers really. They can be, and it kind of makes them better at that job, but building what we're talking about here, at least in RPA, it's, it's, it's based on codeless coding in a way. It's very, very intuitive. It's very easy to access. That's why these companies are making such an impact. It's very easy to spread. All right, so. Now, TJ, you're a certified Automation Network programmer now. I am. So and Bart, you are as well. Yep. Part of, well, so when I came in, we convinced them, you know, part of evangelizing this technology, we convinced them this is cool, this is worth looking at, spend some money. And we kind of walked them through the whole journey of saying, hey, you go invest in this tech, here's the team you need to build, here are some of the problems you're going to encounter. And we were wrong about certain things, and certain, one of the things we were wrong about are the obstacles you run into. I was kind of thinking we'd be arguing about technical details and operating model and kind of design that way. A lot of the battles we fought were around organizational resistance. Fear, misunderstanding, not understanding the technology, and because of that, fearing it. I, I can't even tell you the conversations I had around like, what if the bot goes crazy, it's going to destroy jobs, it will destroy some. Um, but those are the kind of conversations we were having, and I noticed that was why some companies, some conservative companies, were not adopting the tool, because they were scared of it, they were scared of it because they did not understand it, despite it being so simple. Once we convinced a few people to embrace it, they became extremely valuable. One person on the BD account, Mike, you know very well, uh, was a knowledge worker on this curve. He was a very smart guy. He would have been down here. Yeah. Smart guy, ex-KPMG, working for this med device client, downloading reports off of SharePoint, uploading them somewhere else onto ClickView. Uh -huh. So if you know this tool, it's just like, you know, yeah. not a fun job. But we convinced him the technology was worth looking at. We knew that he was a high potential person. We had him automate himself out of his old job to recruit him into automation. He automated, he built a bot, he took the training class that we actually took as well, became yeah. certified. And his first bot was to automate his old job. And because of that, we promoted him into the RPA team. He is now batting left and right offers from Big Four, other companies, 100 plus percent compensation increase. Another developer on a team just left BD for 80% increase in his job. This is only one and a half, two years into the whole gig. And it's not hard to know. I mean, you, you can talk to a two part. It's not difficult. Cog when we get the cognitive, it's a lot of theory. This is Excel macros and steroids. The, the people who are moving into this class are looking at going from job to job. I mean, if they work somewhere and they get into this class and they want to get a proper job, are looking at 50 to 100% increase in their compensation. Mm -hmm. This is because of where the market's at, because they can, because it's a it's a buy, it's a, a seller's market, right? So you, there aren't enough people, so there are people out there and they're just bidding the jobs up. If you go into consulting, which is a higher bar, or in some of the others are crowdsourcing, we'll talk about, it goes beyond the hundred percent. Now I know it sounds too good to be true, but you decide. I'm just telling you that both these guys. Your, your guys' compensation is well over 100, 200% where it was a couple years ago. Right, both of you, is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Bart, we'll tell us a little bit about you. What were you doing? You were at Rutgers? Yeah, so I was um, at Rutgers. I majored in economics, so not a traditional STEM field. Um, and when I came out of school, I was working uh, for a different large healthcare company in uh, kind of a job I would call commercial operations, kind of sales support. And um, after doing that for about a year, year and a half, uh, I didn't kind of illustrate it this way until later on when I started working with Rum Job. But looking back, um, I, I just wasn't passionate about what I was doing. And I uh, realized after kind of learning about a lot of this stuff we talk about uh, at Rum Job that I, I was kind of doing this type of work that TJ described earlier that we had um, a gentleman automate himself out of to move on to a, a more fruitful and more interesting opportunity. So, um, you know. 
for me, even though I wasn't kind of like a technical background, it was uh, exciting to come into this field and be able to learn. Um, just This is just one example, but the Automation Anywhere example, you know, it's about two weeks of training and then some hands-on building of different modules. And as TJ mentioned, it's kind of like a GUI-based development. So something you can get involved with without having um, a lot of technical experience. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so both of you guys have, have again, I've, I've, I'll put you in here. You're not going to say it about yourselves. So I'm going to say it. You're in this emerging expert class. And uh, we need more people like them. Right, because this is, and I'm going to let's just flip through some of this. I'm going to show you how this happens and how you can participate. So, what what's really happening here? So, at the end, of, you have to go back and look at what is the driving factor that's making these this concentration of experts in the market, and where are they coming from? The solution line is what businesses want. They need work done, right? So, this solution line is a. A, think of this as, as a horizontal metaphor. Like people want that. Now the issue is, technology firms on this orange line. I think it's orange. I'm colorblind, so I don't know, but it looks it's like orange. Orange? Is it orange? Mm -hmm. Yes. Orange. Light orange. Light orange. <laughs> it doesn't quite deliver the full solution. It gives you, it, but it's getting there fast on a nonlinear curve. But you need the rest of the labor to de to develop that solution. So it's not like I. I can do all this great stuff, but I still need a little bit of labor to make it. As this moves forward in time, this labor gets compressed. This is what we call residual labor. Now, as you get through time, this residual labor is really expert labor. It's the experts that can make this stuff work, right? So what experts do is they deploy, engineer, manage change, realize the benefits, and manage commercial conflict, which is everywhere. And this is what you guys do, right? You guys don't do coding so much as you manage it. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, so this is your statement of work. Understand it enough to help them. Right. Mm -hmm. So in this space, this is what you do. This is where you this is where you make a lot of money. You actually make more money doing this than actually doing it, right? Which is the management of it. But you, in order to manage it, you have to know it. Let's go to the next slide. Another key point. Residual labor is not derivative. It's not a subset. So the expert, the emerging experts that come out of this, it's not a subset model. It's, not, it's when I start to compress, it's not that I have fewer people. I have a completely different set. So it's very different sets of skill mixes. And so what we're trying to do is how do you, we're, we're looking at three different things. You can go recruit new labor, good luck, right? We have people, one of our clients, gets offered a job, he turns it down, they call back three weeks later, they bump it up to a higher level, more money, he still turns it down. They need to start thinking about reskilling their existing labor. This is the consulting opportunity, is you help them reskill their labor in place while you assist. Recruit new labor, that's if you want to have a job, make more money, and then work syndication, we'll talk about how crowdsourcing is your opportunity to address this residual labor component. Next slide, Bart. This is an example of the crowdsourcing. We're looking, we're doing a project, and I think we're the only ones in the market doing this right now, which is we're working with a crowdsourcing platform called TopCoder. It's a Wipro company, and we're looking to crowdsource automation work, where we can create, you basically have to containerize your work into modules, and then you take those modules and you compete them on these platforms. It's very cool stuff. This is. Again, this is probably the very cutting edge. So we're still experimenting with this to see if this works, if the letter is worth the stamp, so to speak. But we're trying to go do this. Let's go to the next slide. So this expert class, as I look at this, is expert knowledge with an experience in emerging tech deployments. In the larger scheme of things, sits in this broader pyramid, which is you obviously have the 1% crowd, the senators, Mm -hmm. If you don't know what a senator is, it's because you're not one of them. <laughs> okay? And then the expert class, and then underneath it is the unemployable, or the emerging unemployable, which are people who lack the skills and capabilities to contribute to the economic future. And you probably know people like that. Maybe there's people in your family like that who are struggling, who are feeling wage depression, or they're getting layoffs and they're dealing with all of that. I'm sure we all have people like that around us. What's required to sit in this class, this expert class, 
It's an opt-in model, meaning that you're here tonight, you're obviously interested in the topic, you need to opt in, but you need two more ingredients. You need attitude and aptitude in order to go pursue this. The aptitude is you have to have a general ability to do this. I was at a conference out in California with some of the, the leading scientists in the space. One of the guys there was Ray Kurzweil from Google. Some of you guys may know who he is. Uh, it was about 40 or 50 of us who we were talking about the future. A lot of people were talking about, oh, we're going to free everybody up and they're going to become, they're going to write poetry, and they're going to make movies and, and do all kinds of stuff. And then one guy raises his hand and goes, listen, I want to remind everybody that half the population has an IQ of 100 or less. And the room was silent. Right? Because at that point you really know not everybody has the aptitude. This is not an empty word. It's a meaningful word. You have to have the aptitude to do this. But even having the aptitude, we work with a lot of engineers who don't have the attitude, who aren't willing, they think they know it all. They're not willing to step back and learn new things and challenge the things that they already know. And we see this a lot in, I'll call it, it has a lot of this high co age correlation. People in their 40s and 50s tend to not be, have the right attitude towards this change. They're resisting the change. They're saying, oh, this is the same as it used to be. No, this is very different. Trust me, this is very different. Let's go to the next slide. So if you think this is hyperbole, one of the things that got me going back in 2013 was a McKinsey report that came out. I'm a big fan of McKinsey. They're very smart people, like the smartest people on the planet for the most part. I wouldn't want to work there, but uh, I like them as a consultant because they can't actually do any work. They come in, they tell you what to go do, and then the executive says, let's go do it. They say, oh, we don't do anything. And then we come in behind that and we do their work. So I like that. They're, they're my friend and they line the bank account, right? So, so, but they're very smart. And they have a, a McKinsey Global uh, Institute that does a lot of their research. So again, a big fan of their stuff. They're very thoughtful. But in 2013, they wrote an emerging technologies report that they haven't updated, but it's probably, it's worth a perusal. They looked at about 10 technologies and this impact on the global economy. Now, these numbers aren't gonna mean anything to you, so I'm just gonna clear the chart real quick. Number two was the automation of knowledge work. And this was a seminal piece of work that we used to build out largely what's become our practice in our company. The six plus trillion dollars of impact is about 10% of the global economy for labor. So what they're saying is, in the 10 years, now we're five years into it, so, and this is heavily back-end loaded, that by the mid-20, like 2023, 2025 timeframe, you're gonna see a huge portion of the knowledge workers impacted by this. And it's again, back-end loaded. And you're starting to see that today, but you know we're, we see unemployment figures Compressing its all-time low right now, but that's a little bit of a political anomaly. Where I'm telling you behind the scenes what's going to happen is you're going to start to see this come out. Let's go to the next slide. One of the things we started to do to help with our uh, clients to tell this story, because some of the stuff is hard. I mean, if, you know, it's hard to get people to actually read a white paper or read a 50-page PowerPoint or 25-page PowerPoint on this, because it's like, in our attention culture. So we started... We created a small studio group and we've made about 30 or 40 corporate videos like one you're going to see now. And we're actually producing corporate videos to help people understand what's happening and we're trying to communicate. So uh, TJ and his team will put this stuff together to tell a story. And this is we're going to tell a quick story about one of the automations we did for one of the business units here at BD. At BD. We are continuing our investment in automation technology, driving greater agility into our global operations while improving the way we service our customers. To drive faster response times for our sales representatives, we are automating the creation of expansion quotes received when customers call to expand their solution footprint for MMS devices. This process consists of recording customer and order information during the call, creating an opportunity in Salesforce, and finally creating an entry in SAP to produce the quote. The final step in this process is entirely repetitive and extremely tedious, requiring sales representatives to navigate multiple screens within SAP to copy and paste data into the appropriate fields. This can take up to an hour for larger quotes, and representatives must handle several quotes a week. 
What results is a higher latency in response times than what customers expect, while delaying our own revenue. By building a bot to take care of the steps involving SAP, we have removed the need for manual entries to create quotes. Going forward, sales representatives will fill out a basic spreadsheet in the form of a questionnaire during customer calls. They would then perform normal procedures in Salesforce to complete the spreadsheet, before saving it to a shared location monitored by the bot. The addition of the file will trigger the bot to start its work. The bot will refer to the information in the spreadsheet and fill out the various screens in SAP in the same way a human would. The bot will then specify the quote format, save the final PDF produced, and then email the attachment to the sales rep. With this solution in place, we are now able to turn around quotes for MMS products much faster, increasing customer satisfaction, all while reducing manual effort needed by our sales teams, allowing for more time spent on future business development. What these guys are doing is less the programming side of it where you're getting into the nuts and bolts. There's lots of people who help you with that, right? What they're solving is, they're solving business problems that say, if I had better information, I could act better. So in a medical device, I'm a salesperson walking into a hospital. I'm gonna go meet with the administrator about sales. I would do a much better job in that meeting if I had better information about what did they buy last? What did they buy the time before that? Uh, how long has it been since I've been there? All of the packaging of that with all the analytics that says, look, you haven't been here in 30 days, they should be buying an order of this size to help you inform that discussion. So you show up with a lot of information, you're now valuable to that hospital administrator. But today, that information can be had, but it's highly manual to go do that. The salesperson saying, hey, uh, I'm leaving this client, I'm gonna go see the new client, can you give me this information? And people are scrambling around to get them something and they're texting it to them, they're sending them an email, and it's imperfect. But what this is doing is solving those kind of problems over and over and over again. And once solved, once solved, over and over, incrementally at zero, which is why these have huge asymmetric business cases. By asymmetric, I mean you spend this much and you get this much on a recurring basis. Almost too good to be true, Quickly. which is why people will pay anything to get it. I just want to show how simple this looks quickly, Mark. Can you just rewind a little bit? Yeah. Right there. So this is, this is the bot if you were curious about like, what it actually looked like. That's not R, it's not Python, you're not writing in Visual Basic. Uh, it, you, actually, what it looks closest to is if you wrote like, you know, if-then statements in Excel, if you're just doing, you know. It's pseudo-code. It's, it's pseudo code, it's codeless coding, it's, it's very, you know, I can actually read this and tell you what it's doing. It's not kind of encoded, I don't have to speak a computer, a computer language to understand it. It's like, not like reading the matrix and saying a red, a blonde yeah. just walk by in a red dress. It's not that. <laughs> All right. it's exactly. I can't do that. It's so in that way, it's even more simple than typing out an Excel function. It's it's literally that simple. But even think of T TJ, how many, like line sixty two, delay five seconds, sixty seven, five seconds, sixty nine. You're doing that because the system response times. Yeah. Right. If the it, it, what's going to happen in the next version of this is imagine all the systems start to tune, and the data becomes resident in a um, composite ecosystem these system latencies will come out. So this, this clone will operate, this, uh, this drone uh, or, or automation will operate in a few minutes, but it could operate in a few seconds. We're, they're actually inserting lines of code here to delay it because the systems that it's interacting with can't keep up. But it will, that'll get solved in the next version of it. Where you're seeing things are starting to move at machine speed and humans just can't compete. If we look at what happened on Wall Street, we're here in New York, financial center of the world, we saw this happen and play out completely with equity trading, where we automated quotes, we automated trade execution, we automated market data, we automated a bunch of stuff and blah, 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 soon you have high frequency trading. And people can't even participate in high frequency trading, right? Because as you're reaching down to hit the enter key to buy something, something was bought and sold three times, right, across multiple markets. So you can't even participate. So when starts, things start happening at machine speed, it's a completely different game. Where you make money is understanding how this works, where it can be applied, and how to engineer it into a system and fight all the things that these guys deal with. You guys are doing less of this kind of coding stuff. This is part of your job, but most of your job is political. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Po political? 
you're dealing with people saying, oh, I can't do this, or the regulator saying, I don't understand this, or somebody saying, oh, this is too aggressive, or whatever, you're dealing, if you were only doing this, you're cranking this stuff out in hours, right? And they say it takes a week, it's really about six hours across a week. Pretty cool stuff. Where does um, the Power BI fit in? So Power BI, Power BI is a, uh, a data visualization tool. Um, we do, so how automation would fit into this? Um, we've actually run projects where bots like this would go and fetch data from a whole bunch of like, disparate sources and kind of stage it so that a Power BI, for example, could display it and kind of use those reports more effectively. Right? The, the issue with the Power BI reports, of course, you need the skills to actually build one and have it look nice, but you also need to go and get the data itself. That whole part of it is mundane, it's just tedious. And Exactly. Right. But through an open API, so all those different components, you showed Salesforce, you showed Excel, you're API leveraging can. open APIs of all of those. Ideally systems. API, a lot of uh, the issue is where RPA is powerful, a lot of these systems don't have useful APIs or you have to build custom ones. So, because they were built for humans to use, so all those forms that you fill out are the only way to download something or to extract information. Which we've, is why the bot can interact with it. We've just been contracted by one of our clients to build um, something like a Power BI, but for the enterprise. Power BI is a tool, but we would build something that would be more akin to, I mean, when I worked at uh, at and they have the, uh, you know, these big knocks you'll see occasionally when there's a big network outage, they'll show, like, it looks like NASA, all these screens. So we're going to take that concept, called a single pane of glass, and uh, we have a two-phase project. The first phase is to provide a single pane of glass in a passive way to look at all the telemetry that's in the environment. Organize it, present it, uh, uh, so that you can make decisions about that. Once we do the first version, then you start to introduce active measures to say, I'm now going to give you the ability to control the ecosystem by adjusting the dial. So imagine I could change price for product. Imagine I could change service levels and see what happens to the ecosystem. Imagine I change order and ship times. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things you can start to do where you start to turn the dials. If you think of the future of the digital agenda being highly data driven, getting the data presentation layer and then understanding how you drive controls into that system is the future. So that's our next project that we're working on. Um, if I told you we had it figured out, we have no idea how we're going to go do it. Um, but we're going to figure it out, and we're going to figure it out with our clients. The more interesting integration to your question, though, is downstream from the Power BI dashboard. So, so you're tracking thresholds, maybe inventory. Mm -hmm. Have the bots act on the information that they see. So inventory is too low. The two. It's the self-healing. That's when we get into supply chains becoming organisms, kind of the metabolism being data in this case, right? Data consumption and analysis. Certain things are triggered. You have rules in place, build these automations, go act on it instantly. And in our lexicon, that is autonomics. Mm -hmm. Versus in a, a Power BI that says, you're red, you're red, you're red. Now it would say, you're red, and I just took this action. Yeah, you're just right, you're so right. the, uh, it's hard enough to just say you're red, to get that information organized. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to then be able to have protocols in place to act on that without human intervention. Mm -hmm. You know, the self-healing system. Think about how hard it is for the Google car to turn left. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, societally we haven't even figured out these business control rules. When we get into deploying active measures, active technologies about making decisions, mm -hmm. in high frequency trading they look past some of the stuff because they're making so much money. Mm -hmm. But on the left hand turn for Google, all right, so the car's gonna turn left and an accident is going to happen. Not because the car turned left, because of something outside of the control, and it has two choices. Does it hit the woman in the crosswalk with a baby carriage, or does it veer right and hit the homeless person? Now, to add to the complication, it's able to do facial recognition on the woman and on the person and pull their FICO scores, pull their crime <laughs> records, all in real time, and, it, and develop a social quotient for this person. So this person has a score of an eight, and this person over here is a four. Do I veer and hit the four and save the eight? 
What's the criteria for doing that? We don't, we're not even prepared to talk about it. It's even uncomfortable of me saying it to you. You're like, oh, I don't know. Because today what happens is people just go, ooh, they just appear. <laughs> they hit, the, hit the wrong person. And we accept that as an outcome. But now with the software and the advanced technologies, you're going to start to see implications that we haven't thought through. And these are, again, some of the things, to, if, if this is interesting to you and you're like, wow, I just, that's too technical for me. There's a whole public policy side of this that no one's thinking about from a regulatory, from a business controls. And if you happen to be that type of person who's good about that, you can start to ask those right questions. The opportunities to become a emerging expert are abundant. And it requires simply you to opt in, have the attitude and the aptitude to go drive this. And, and again, we have three philosophies that we have at our firm that are absolutely critical to our success, which the first one is we don't worry about money so much as we focus on impact. We make an impact and the money follows. There's a story I read about a billionaire giving a uh, graduation speech. And he said, hey, who wants to be a billionaire? All the kids raise their hand. They all do. He goes, impact a billion people. And then, you know, the, then it's obvious what happens after that. The second thing we do is whatever we're doing, whether it's a project, a client, a, an ecosystem, a, a task team, <coughs> is contribute more than you take out. Always put in more than you take out. And the last thing is have fun. So if you don't like this stuff, then don't do it. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of hard work. You have to study on night and on weekends, but if you consider it study and drudgery and work, you won't do it. If it's fun, like, hey, I saw this cool video on Google Duplex and they're doing this, that, and the other thing, and, and people don't, don't mind chatting about that on Friday night or a Saturday morning or a Sunday afternoon, then if that stuff bothers you, then you can't do it. But if that stuff excites you, then the, the, the world is your oyster here because I'm telling you, the money is... There's more money than there are people to, 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 to satisfy all the needs. Any other questions? Ask me some questions. So do you envision it that you have this skill set and you could just be a consultant, just like back in the day when SQL came out? Yeah. If you were a SQL programmer, you could write your, you know, your ticket and work eight, six months out of the year and uh, it, the rest it, of it. I mean, it depends how hard you want to work. Um, I would tell you that I've been a consultant, I've been an employee. Being a consultant is a lot harder work in terms of just raw effort. Because if people are gonna pay a premium for you to be there, you better be being a premium. That means getting in early, staying late, put, crank, cranking out work faster than they ever could. So if you're not prepared to do that consulting work, then you can't do that. That doesn't mean there isn't plenty of opportunities to be an employee. But I would say you really should just sit back and say, what do you want to go do and pursue that in this space? And, and you can engage with us. We're happy to help people. We help a lot of people who don't join our team. Uh, we're, again, about making an impact on people's lives and the, and the firms that we deal with. So I would just really, you, you're, everyone's situation is unique. You have to, well, the, one of the terms that we use, and we didn't talk about in this talk tonight, is the notion of recombinant innovation. The innovation in the future is going to be taking this, that, and something else, bringing it together to create something new. Take some of your old experience, take some of your current experience, and learn some new skill, bring it all together, and create something new, right? So uh, we can go through a lot of exercise with people individually, but it really is an individual choice. My background is engineering. I, I did some programming when I was younger. I know how all this stuff works, but I haven't done programming in 35 years. Right, so, but I, I generally know how it works and I see how easy it is. You could, you know, learn this in a week. Right, but when you look at like potential jobs like in the U.S. and certainly your, your Wipro concert yep. concept in terms of we talk about putting in a container, I'm assuming you're, you're parsing out mm -hmm. components of your projects. You know, is that descended overseas or, you know, replicating that model? So Top Coder, Top Coder is Wipro's company. And there's two aspects to the work there. One is the containerization and organization of the work. That's the consulting side of it, which is how do I take input and say, all right, now I'm going to put it into a framework that uses the crowdsourcing markets. So there's a consulting side of that. On the actual doing of the work, there are 1.5 million developers and designers on Topcoder. Of the 1.5 million, 
I would say 250 to 300,000 probably make a full-time living. The rest of them are augmenting their income. Probably the top 30 to 50,000 are making more money than, they're probably making like uh, professional sports athletes. And they surf when they want. They work when they want. They do what they want. They're the, they're the, they're the real experts at doing really cool stuff. So I've talked to some of the coders who actually do the work. I say, how did you decide what to do? Because top coders are winner-take-all competition. So they put a competition out for a container of work. 10 teams might compete, only one gets paid. So you put a lot of effort in to get zero. And uh, the guys say, well, you quickly learn how many times you have to hit page down on the gig list before you can compete. Very similar to online gaming. If you play first-person shooters on Xbox, you go into the expert room, you will be killed as soon as you respawn. <laughs> right? Right? So don't do it. Go to the beginner one and shoot people who are trying to figure out where to put their thumbs on the control pad. That's fun. You can't make much money, but you get better and better and you move up the, you move up the boards. The guy I talked to was a 20-year-old uh, uh, Indian uh, man who uh, put his last year through school paint using Taco. When he was in India, he paid for his entire tuition. But it really, again, depends on what you want to do. I mean, we think about your prior experience, what you can do. There's, there's again, more opportunities than there are people. What we tell people is uh, there's more seats on the bus than there are people to raise their hand, but there aren't enough seats for everyone. Because not everyone will raise their hand. And pass the test, which is attitude and aptitude. I'm curious from your experience working with clients outside the technology industry, which companies in the industry or which industries seem to be jumping on the bus with this more often and getting it right, getting it more right. Yeah, so financial services is the is in the lead in this space. They have the biggest budgets, the smartest people, uh, and are years ahead of other industries. I would say the healthcare pharma is probably the hottest space right now because there is so much human middleware in the system that is begging for technologies like this to come in and solve their problems. As soon as we can get regulators to look at this technology relative to workflow automation, they're going to require it in order to perform functions. Because if I have people involved with compliance for anything from a clinical trial to managing healthcare information and records. Think of the, the GDPR that's happening in Europe today in terms of records keeping and some of the very strict Swiss rules. The regulars that can now know with some certainty, what we're gonna do a future meetup and talk about blockchain technologies. Now blockchain is a immutable distributed ledger that allows for us to take what goes on here and log it into a ledger that is immutable and distributed and visible if I put the right presentation layer to a regulator so they can see everything that's going on and know that it wasn't monkeyed with, that it was authenticated. They're gonna to start to say, I require this for you to participate in this regulated market to have this. So there's, again, tremendous opportunities here to go do this, but I would say the hottest space right now is in pharma and healthcare. And again, you can be an expert in foreign healthcare, just study. Just go out and read stuff. <coughs> when I started consulting, uh, the American, you guys know Sarbanes-Oxley, right? That was big in the yeah, mid-2000, yeah. right? So I was, at a, I was at a partner's conference when I was uh, down in DC, I was working for this company. And I'm sitting there, I was just in the audience and I'm looking around, they're talking about Sarbanes-Oxley's gonna be the end of the world for us because we did a lot of monkey business. And, uh, <laughs> and like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, the sky's falling. So I'm looking around and, and I'm realizing nobody in here knows what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> so they all went to the bar and had a party that night. I went back to my room and I read everything I could find and wrote a short white paper on Sarbanes for our firm. The next day I was the firm's expert and I was hosting panels with lawyers and stuff like that and being interviewed by the press and shit like that. You can be an expert, you just have to apply yourself and be confident that what you know is important and relevant to people. Don't assume that because you don't know that there's somebody else out there who does know. There might be a situation where people just don't know. Study, make yourself relevant. 
Make yourself relevant to the firm you're working for. This goes back to our first principle at Rumjog, make an impact. 